Hello once again. It's nice to be recording this lesson on a nice summery morning with sunshine instead of overcast and rain. I came across a, a German proverb just in the last week on the internet. It says, despise school and remain a fool. And the idea is that we should value learning. Another quote that I came across goes something like this. Every person that you will ever meet knows something that you don't. So therefore we should be willing to listen to others and to learn from them. Schools are not the only places where we can learn and professional teachers are not the only people from whom we can learn, as valuable as their teaching can be. And something else to keep in mind here is that success isn't simply about how much we learn, but rather success uh, involves remembering what we learn and applying what we learn. And we sometimes get into difficulties in life because we either forget or choose to ignore some of the valuable lessons that we've learnt. There has always been learning. But there hasn't always been schools. And even when there were schools, not everybody had the opportunity to spend a lot of time at school. For instance, years ago when I was living in Tasmania, it wasn't uncommon to meet some older country folk who oftentimes had never gone beyond primary school. In the case of my own grandmother on my father's side, she was one of six children and they grew up in the east end of London in one of the poorer suburbs. And even though some of them could have gone on in school, the family couldn't afford it. And so every one of them left school at the age of 14 in order to go out to work to earn some money. I did some reading on how children learned back in biblical times, particularly uh, in Old Testament times. The indication is that it was during the Babylonian captivity, uh, 606 to 536 BC, that the idea of synagogues developed and this gradually spread to Jewish towns in many places and the synagogue became a place of learning for uh, adults and uh, particularly in regard to the Old Testament scriptures but I also read that by the time of Jesus synagogues were also providing schools for children as well and according to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia before the development of the synagogue the house was the school and parents were the teachers and therefore home learning isn't new. Home learning in fact goes back a long way and you can see evidence of it in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. If we go back to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. Hear my son your father's instruction and forget not your mother's teaching. Or you can go over to Proverbs chapter 6 and there read from verse 20 my son keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching bind them on your heart always tie them around your neck when you walk they will lead you when you lie down they will watch over you and when you awake they will talk with you for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light so here in Proverbs, we see the idea of parents doing the teaching, and in fact, that goes on from generation to generation. Parents teach uh, the children, the children grow up, and they teach the next generation, and so forth. We see in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Solomon was the son of King David. And if you go over to chapter 4, the indication there is that David took time to teach uh, at least Solomon. Uh, he had other sons as well, but uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, 
When I was a son, with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honour you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. So here Solomon says his father, who would, was David, taught him the value of wisdom. And there's a great emphasis upon that, uh, particularly in the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs. Uh, some years ago, I taught a sermon on King David as a father and, and the evidence indicates that he was not the uh, most successful of fathers uh, in, in several ways and as a result of that he had problems with his children but nevertheless the indication here in chapter 4 and verse 3 is that David did make time to give his son Solomon instruction and it wasn't just that fathers taught their sons, mothers I would teach as well and I go back again to chapter 6 and verse 20 my son keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching and that was something that the old Jewish law emphasized God said that uh, parents should teach their children particularly about God's word and it's 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 uh, instructions we go back for instance to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 and verse 4 and uh, we find some instructions there Deuteronomy chapter 6 reading from verse 4 hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you uh, lie down and when you rise. Come back to Exodus chapter 12 and uh, verse 24. Dale Hartman uh, mentioned a concept many years ago of uh, teaching opportunities and uh, we see this coming out several times in God's word for instance in Exodus 12 instructions are given from God for the establishment of the annual Passover feast and notice here in Exodus 12 and verse 24 you shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever and when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. So each year as the Passover was celebrated, there was an opportunity to answer the questions that would arise uh, in the children's mind. Why are we doing this? You go over the page to Exodus chapter 13 and verse 8. Here is the context of the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasted seven days after the Passover. Verse 8, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And then a bit further down uh, in verse 14, and this is in application to certain other things, and when in time to come your son asks you what does this mean, you shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. So as uh, the Jews celebrated uh, various memorials, there was an opportunity, it would raise questions in the minds of the children and the adults had an opportunity to explain the significance and these would have been teaching opportunities. And it's not just in the 
uh, Old Testament that this idea of teaching children uh, was taught, but it, it carries over into the New Testament as well. If we have a look, for instance, at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, uh, there's an instruction there to fathers. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then we can go over a little bit further to 2 Timothy, the first chapter, where Paul is speaking to Timothy. And uh, Paul says there in verse 5 of chapter 1, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Uh, the interesting point there is he doesn't, Paul doesn't mention Timothy's father. Why would that be? Well, if we go back to Acts the 16th chapter, uh, it's explained there that Timothy's father was a Gentile. And so he wouldn't have followed the, the Jewish law, the Old Testament teachings. So it was his mother and uh, it, in, it appears to his grandmother uh, who taught Timothy. In fact, we go again just over the page to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. And Paul again is speaking to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and whom there is plural, incidentally, so more than one person taught Timothy, verse 15, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So somebody had taught Timothy from when he was a child. Who would that have been? Well, the indication is his mother. So both fathers and mothers had a role to play in teaching their children. And so an older generation would teach their children just as David taught Solomon. But then as the children grew up, as Solomon did, then they in turn would teach their children. And this comes out again and again in the book of Proverbs. Uh, as we look at the language that Solomon uses here, the idea of a father teaching children, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8, Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Forget not your mother's teaching. We go down a little bit further to verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them, with sinners, in other words. And then notice how each chapter begins. Chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Chapter 3, and verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Chapter 4, and verse 1. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you might gain insight. Chapter 5, and verse 1. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. Chapter 6, and verse 1. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, and that continues on, chapter 7 and verse 1, my son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. As I said there, you've got Solomon writing this as though he's teaching his son or sons. So you've got an intergenerational thing here where David taught Solomon, then Solomon taught his sons, amongst whom was Rehoboam. And we'll come to him in just a while. So parents can teach their children all sorts of things about life and particularly about spiritual matters. We can't leave it all to schools, particularly spiritual teaching. Teachers have enough on their plates without having to take over every role of parents. We as parents need to teach our children so that they can live and so that they can follow God as well, or at least come to know God. Of course, if God wants parents to teach, then there should also be a willingness of children to listen and to learn. And, and that's a challenge because children don't always want to listen. When they're young, sometimes they're fidgety, their minds are on other things. And then of course, as they grow older, they have an increasing sense of independence. Furthermore, if the lives of the parents are not consistent 
with the Christian things that they're saying, then the children quickly spot that. So really, the teaching of children is a serious matter that requires considerable thought on, in regard to parents. Not only what to teach, but how to teach it effectively. Uh, when sometimes to teach, when might be the best opportunity. And also the example that the parents uh, provide, because you might say one thing with your mouth, you might read something from the scriptures, but meanwhile, your example as a parent might be saying something completely different. So there is a challenge, and this is a matter not to be taken lightly. But at the same time, let's realize that parents are not on their own. Come back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 in the New Testament. Uh, the church has a teaching role. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul again speaking to Timothy, You then, my child, and he's simply a younger man, he's, he's not a young child here, but you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Paul had taught and trained Timothy. Timothy, in turn, was to teach and train others, and those others, in turn, were to teach still others. And so it goes on. So the church is to teach. And for instance, you go back to the commission that Jesus gave to his apostles. They were to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, if we're going to preach the gospel to the world, then surely that can involve young ones as well. As we teach their parents, but then also help the parents to teach the children. And so uh, the church can assist in various ways. If, if parents consistently bring their, their children along to church gatherings, um, we can teach by means of the singing, we can teach by means of the preaching, we can teach by means of what we say about the communion, the Lord's Supper, we can teach by means of what we say about the giving. And uh, we can teach by means of our general con conduct as a church. We can uh, teach too by having Bible classes. There's all sorts of ways that the church provides teaching. And then at home, the parents teach their children. Uh, the parents, again, looking to their own conduct because we teach by example as well as by word. And in this way, the church supplements the home teaching and the home teaching supplements the church teaching and hopefully uh, helps our children to grow up with a good grasp of God and Christ and Christianity and the scriptures. So there is a call here for teaching and for learning. But there's another aspect to this that we also need to keep in mind. It has been joked uh, often at school that the role of learning in school is to simply get you through exams. And so you can have the idea that, okay, I've finished the exams now, I can forget what I've learned. And that does happen in some things. Um, you know, I, for a while at high school, I did woodwork and metalwork. Well, I can't say that I've ever gone on much with those things. I'm no good in those areas. Uh, I remember learning um, uh, calculus. I don't think I've ever used calculus since I left high school. Now, I see the value of learning because it teaches you logic and it teaches you what knowledge is out there. Um, but, you know, in, in various cases, we do forget a lot of what we learn at school. But in re regard to learning about life and in regard to learning about spiritual matters, we need not only to learn, but we need to hold on to what we learn and we need to, re uh, to apply what we learn. And this too is illustrated by Solomon and his family. If you go back uh, in the Old Testament to 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 6, as we've seen, 
David taught his son Solomon and Solomon certainly writes as though he's teaching his sons as well. But unfortunately, Solomon either forgot or chose to ignore some of what he learned and Solomon's son Rehoboam chose to forget or to ignore some of what he learned. 1 Kings 11 and verse 6, this applies to Solomon later in life. For Solomon, um, so Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. And then you go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 1. This relates to Rehoboam. Following the death of Solomon, Rehoboam became king of Israel. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, he made some big mistakes. Second Chronicles 12 and verse 1. Rehoboam, when the rule of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. So both Solomon and then Rehoboam forgot or ignored things that they had been taught. And for both of them, one of the factors in this was that they gave in to other influences. So Solomon had been taught, and indeed uh, Solomon had been spoken to by God himself. But look at the other negative influence, the big, inf uh, the big negative influence that entered into Solomon's life back in 1 Kings 11 and verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. These were pagan women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as the, far, the heart of his, as was the heart of David his father. I finally got it out. And so it continues there. Solomon allowed himself to be influenced by his pagan wife. Similarly, you go over the page to 1 Kings chapter 12 and you read there about Rehoboam. Rehoboam became king of Israel and the people came to Rehoboam and said, look, your father was very hard on us. If you would just relax things a little, we will be your loyal subjects. And so Rehoboam said, okay, give me a chance to think about this. And he went off to the elders, the men who had advised his father. And the elders said, yeah, this is a good thing. If you will ease off, they will stand with you. But Rehoboam didn't listen. Rehoboam went off to the young men that he had grown up with men no more experienced than he was and they said look you need to show them how tough you are and so he took the strong man approach to the people and said you think my father was tough wait till you see what i do and israel said well if that's the way you think then we're off and 10 of the tribes broke away from rehoboam and formed the northern tribe of israel so as i say the need is not only to learn but also to hold on to the good things that we learn and to apply them in our lives. Because as we grow older, we make a choice. And I often think of this with young people as they grow up and leave high school and move on. Now, they've, they've grown up perhaps in the church. They've learned a great deal uh, in the church. They've learned from their parents. But now they make choices as they come under other influences. And they either choose, choose to stick with Christianity and with God and with Christ and to grow in their faith or else they turn away and allow themselves to follow the negative influences in their lives. That's the choice that we all face as we grow older. Now in this lesson I have oversimplified things. I've talked as though 
we, when we're young, uh, we learn, and then as we grow older, we simply apply what we once learned. I've talked in terms of we learn when we're young, and then as we grow older and begin become parents, then we teach. So we go from learning to teaching. But it's not like that. In our society today, particularly in education in regard to uh, employment, there is this concept of lifelong learning. We don't just learn and then uh, finish high school or finish university and, and simply work for the rest of our life. But we go on learning, we go on training. And indeed, in our society today, even after you retire, there are, are institutions like U3A uh, that provide teaching for retired people in a whole range of subjects. And this is a principle that we need to apply in regard to the scriptures and Christianity and learning for life. Uh, today in the Bankstown congregation we're having a, a special day to uh, mark our children and to encourage the children and that raises a number of issues. It says that we who are older and particularly parents need to accept the role of teaching our children and um, that involves serious consideration, as I've already said, how can we best teach our children? How do we deal with children as they go through the various stages of growing older? And we have to consider the example that we set as role models and not just what we say. Um, we, all of us, need to be willing to learn. And that includes children at home, particularly as children grow older, you know, we go into our teenage years and sometimes we don't want to be bothered with listening to our parents and so forth. But if we are sincere about Christianity, then part of that involves uh, respecting learning from our parents. And of course, that calls for parents too to, to be proper examples and not just to talk about Christianity, but to live Christianity ourselves. And then as we grow older uh, and as we move away from the home and from parents and from school and come under more and more influences, every one of us has to make a decision. Will I continue with the positive things that I learnt while I was young or will I go off into negative things that are just going to lead me astray? We need to value learning and we need to value teaching. If we can teach, do so to the best of our abilities. If we can learn, strive to do so again to the best of our abilities, particularly in regard to spiritual matters and life matters, because these are things that will go with us forever. We need to be people who are especially focused on learning about God, learning about Christ, and learning the lessons that God and Christ provide in regard to living this life in preparation for eternity. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that uh, you have given us evidence of yourself. Uh, we can see evidence of um, wisdom and intelligence in the way that the world is organized uh, we can uh, at the same time learn from your word uh, we can test your word in the light of the history it records we can see that in case after case after case the history is accurate the geography is accurate accurate your word is reliable Jesus did live. Jesus did perform miracles testifying to who he was. Jesus did arise from the tomb, again testifying to who he was. And so we've got every reason to believe in you, every reason to believe in your word. Help each one of us to learn, to recognize the value of learning, to learn about you, to learn about Christ, to learn about the Holy Spirit, to learn about the context of your word, to learn about the church, to learn about how Christianity improves our lives and prepares us for what lies beyond. 
Help us to take these things seriously and to value them. Help us to share them with our families and to share them with fellow Christians and, and with young people at church. And at the same time, Lord, as we go on, help us to remember these things and to apply these things in our lives that, so that not only will we speak of these things, but we'll be living examples of these things as well. You've given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Help us to take these things with gratitude and to apply them to our lives and to always walk in your ways. We pray through Christ. Amen. Thank you again for taking time to uh, be with me for this. Uh, it's not the you with me it's that it's an opportunity to look at the word and every one of us should be there doing that learning from it and seeing what we can find out and yes it'll raise questions not every part is easy but continue on with it persevere with it ask questions and find out so that you can grow more and more in the understanding of what God is saying and put it into action in your own life. If you want to learn more, there'll be the usual links on the screen and there is our uh, contact address, our website, churchofchristbankstown.org. You're welcome to get in touch and if we can answer your questions, we will certainly endeavour to do that or to give you material uh, that might help you uh, in your journey. Take care, uh, look after yourselves, and I hope to see you again next time. Bye until then.